Hi there. So, Bob's in charge of the payload, and I am handling the ground side. Bob asked me to do this, and I said yes. My name is Michelle, W5NYV. I got some, uh, I got some book learning here, uh, and I got a lot of practical experience. I enjoy thinking and doing, not necessarily in that order. This is where you can track me down. Just look for Abraxas 3D. Slides will be available later, so if you really want to track me down, you can. Prize time. This is an exercise. Stand up. If you can't stand up, you can raise your hand. Just keep track of whether or not you're standing or sitting. I know it, it can be hard sometimes, especially if you code for hours on end. So, if you can stay standing if you can answer yes to these questions. Do you have a smartphone? If you do not, sit. Do you know the transmit frequency of your smartphone? You can, honor system, honor system. Do you know the receive frequency of your smartphone? You pick. What standard does it use? TIA, EIA? Do you know the standard that it uses? Okay, can I just say LTE? That, that's, that, 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 okay. Would you recognize the waveform that it receives? Oh, okay. What's the dynamic range, the power output of your phone? Okay. Without downloading an app, can you name the cell tower that you're connected to? Oh. Without downloading an app? Without downloading an app. Okay. Can you name any field in the control frame sent to your phone? Anybody still standing out there? Anybody? GPRF. <laughs> Very good. All right, so I have some prizes. I saw a few of you, there's at least three of you that were still standing. You, you deserve the medal for the prize. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you get a fidget spinner. This is a special fidget spinner. This, this went to Burning Man and Death <laughs> I need it badly. You get the speed It's got all sorts of cool stuff. Can, so can you good. assure me this is lead free? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I cannot. Okay, so I hope this exercise was fun. And this is our challenge to you. The phase four ground station includes a lot of technology that's in that little HT that you have in your pocket that talks to that repeater cell site. And our goal is to make that stuff understandable, open source, and usable by hams, especially on this project, but also terrestrial. So that's, a, that's what we want. That's our goal here. Uh, our implementation is DVB S2 and S2X. DVB stands for Digital Video Broadcasting. It is the most popular standard for space uh, broadcast, for subscription broadcast from, or for TV satellite. Uh, the S stands for space because DVB has a lot of different standards. They have terrestrial, they have news uploading, they have all sorts of crazy stuff. It's awesome. They're all open. You can go download them and if you need help falling asleep, then you can read all of them. At the two in the S2 stands for second generation, and it is a huge improvement. It's really awesome. It's a great standard. The X, the S in S2X, is an extension to DVB S2. The reason why we're very interested in it is because the X had, it, it filled in very low SNR modulation encodings, and also very very high. So new generations of satellites uh, for commercial broadcast, are very powerful signals, huge constellations, very big data rates. We're not as interested in that. We're interested in the other end, the DVB S2X for mobile satellite devices, small radios, smaller antennas, stuff like that we want to do. Uh, the CQC project, the lunar project, that is a really killer 
uh, path loss there. You really need lots of coding to help you overcome that path loss. So the DBBS 2X standard, that's what we're diving into. Our job is to learn it and then implement it and then teach you how to do it so that you can build your own or buy a radio, an amateur radio that does these standards. Okay, so that's our current technical goal. Our big one is to take this standard and make it happen. And the, our main motivation at first was the 4B payload, but 4A is also something we're out to support. Uh, there's a, several phase three satellites that are talking about using this, uh, and also terrestrially. So what we wanna do is provide you DIY, and we wanna make sure that we have, and we have a partner for manufacturing. We have at least one, and we're talking to another one. Uh, Flex Radio is still totally on board and helping out, and uh, several of the Flex Radio people are on the team. Now, we, you, you starting out with such a really big challenge, and it is. We're essentially saying, let's go design essentially a, a cell phone radio, and let's make it fun and interesting, and let's do it with volunteers. Oh, and our launches keep changing, and wow, it's, it can be crazy, but it's fun, trust me. So here we are, we're designing, building, and testing a dual band feed for five and 10. So it's five and dime, it's five gigahertz up, that's the FDMA part, 10 gigahertz down, that's the TDM part. We want full duplex. Well, what do you immediately notice about five and 10? Might have a second harmonic problem, right? Okay, so we have, with lots of help, Paul Wade's design and a bunch of other people pitching in and working on it. We've got a working uh, dual band feed. So it's out in the demo room and you can see the results. Uh, we, have a, we brought a machined version and we brought a 3D printed version that's been metalized with uh, paint, with conductive paint. All right, and then specifically, our, our goal is to get all of this radio design into GNU radio so that anybody can use it. So we need to write a bunch of blocks specific for DVBS2 and S2X. The transmitter is already in GNU radio. You can take DVBS2 and those blocks and that flow graph and transmit DVBS2 today. The receivers are harder, much harder than transmitters. So our job, we took it upon ourselves is today, our reference design is going to live in GNU radio. Uh, Okay, we also want to take a GPU. In this case, a GPU is a, is a graphical processing unit, so like an NVIDIA graphics card. And hey, that massive forward error correction coding that they use in DVBS2, that LDPC, BCH stuff, really matches up very well to video, uh, video cards. So we're gonna, and we have a, a demo, we, it works, and we're trying to get it working here. Uh, so we have, we have that going on. We've been able to achieve this. That's a big step. This is an open source thing. Uh, as far as we know, the first time that this particular decode has been done and then open sourced. We also want to do it on an FPGA. Now these two things are very closely related because they're both very parallel uh, and we're hoping, cross your fingers, that we can take our working GPU code by Charles Brain in the UK and then get it to work on an FPGA. We also have, uh, Wally Ritchie is working on a board that takes an ASIC, uh, so this is where you purchase an ASIC for the decode. There are some chips showing up on the market for DVB S2X, that extension that gives you the very low SNR. It's a, it's a recent extension to the standard. Chips are not widely available. They've been sampled and we have a, a good source and uh, Wally already had an NDA with the company. So this is coming along. This board is gonna be great. We are deliberately designing it so that it works with a variety of uh, bandwidths and it works for 4A as well as 4B and it gives us a lot of flexibility moving forward. Almost all of these things are, they're not really finished radios even though they can be the heart of a radio that works. These are for development for the application layer which Steve Conklin will talk about in his talk if you look it up in the schedule. Um, so one of the big ticket items is uh, something that Bob talked about is a polyphase filter bank takes a lot of math and you got to stare at it for a while, but this is the real heart of the whole operation. This turns a whole bunch of channels into something that you can manage and multiplex, process, and then turn into a big fat pipe down. So we've made a lot of progress recently uh, trying to do this. Um, and another thing that we've decided to go ahead and try to do is on the uplink, instead of making you go through an intermediate device that uh, allows you to use legacy uh, FM or analog, we're just going to try to do it all at once. So your channel that you get assigned, if you use our digital uplink, you know, QPSK, 
yeah, it'll, it'll work. It'll, it'll work great. We also want it to where your HT, your analog HT, will work too, and that we handle the digitization of that. And another even bigger uh, ambitious thing is to take something like um, uh, System Fusion, or C4FM, and be able to recognize it and natively handle that. Now that's like, if you've ever done a Kickstarter and there's stretch goals on Kickstarter, that's a stretch goal. There's one open source project for System Fusion. So you can find it on GitHub. It's a little bit herky-jerky, but it, it works. We used it at GNU Radio Conference this past September. And that's very exciting, because that means that that standard uh, C4FM for System Fusion, we, we'll be, we have a code base to work from. All right, and then uh, uh, this, is a, this is a big deal. We are not gonna have crappy codecs for this radio. We are not going to use low bit rate crappy sounding codecs. And we have Bruce Parents to thank for this and a lot of other people. We are gonna use great sounding codecs because that's the product, is the way that it sounds. Usually you're gonna use it for voice, unless you're like me and never talk on the radio. But our codecs will sound great because we are just gonna use higher rate codecs. We are not trying to cram lots of subscribers, people that pay us, into as many of them into the, the bandwidth we have. We have to have recognizable, clearly understood voice. This is the number one thing that public service people complain about with their radios in emergencies, that the codecs are crappy, they can't understand the, the other fire person that they're talking to. It comes up in, in, in scenario after scenario and survey after survey. We're not gonna make that same mistake. Donations. We've had a bang up year. We managed to get a lot of equipment licenses and, uh, and a little bit of cash. So we passed the $300,000 mark over the past year. The bulk of that is RF simulation software from ANSOS, ANSYS. So we were able to get a license for Paul Wade so he could continue his work since he retired and lost access to HFSS. The company thought it was such a good idea that they gave it to another ham active in the community. And he didn't want me, he or she, they didn't want me to say uh, who they were, but we were able to get two licenses. Uh, the other people that have donated has been Xilinx, very, very generous, and Edis Corporation with lots of USRPs. Okay, so demographics. We've noticed some interesting things. Um, we like to pay attention to this because the success of our project and the, and the success of amateur radio are tied together. So there's some good news and then some bad news and some bad news. And we have a poster session out there with a lot more detail. This is one kind of summary slide. When it comes to demographics, phase four ground is pretty good on age. We have a very good age distribution. And there's reasons for this. We're using a very, very recent digital broadband standard that's used at microwave frequencies. And we're using lots of tools and, and techniques and things uh, that appeal to a broad range of ages and a lot of young people. So that's probably one reason. Another reason is that we are solidly 100% open source and we strive very hard to be open process. There's a difference. Open source, you publish your source at the end. You publish your schematics. You show your hand. But in a lot of cases, you'll see people, they won't share their work until they're really happy with it, until they're done at the end. And then sometimes maybe they don't handle the feedback very well. What we strive to do is to be open all the way. And we publish early and often, even if it's a smoking pile of rubble, doesn't compile, won't work. We publish and we talk about it and we talk with each other and we try to get as much critique and feedback as possible. It's not for everyone and it can take some getting used to, but that's our particular commitment. It also means that all along the way, all of our stuff is published and we are absolutely not ITAR at all. We have lots of people from all over the globe. You can see out in the demo room our demographics uh, are, we have a lot of different countries represented. This is age, um, so it's, it, this is 13 to 17. We actually have some people in our community, uh, this is from YouTube statistics, that are 13 to 17. And you can see the bulk here, uh, 55 to 64, that's kind, of, that's kind of understandable. The gray over here is dudes. And this is, this, is, this is gals. Now, at first that doesn't look too good. And it really isn't. It's one of the areas that's been hard. I've tried very hard to make this project friendly and accessible. 
You do not have to be an expert to join. You just have to be willing to maybe accidentally become one. There is no dumb questions. Whatever tool we can, we can find to make it easy for you to participate and whatever thing that we can do to make it a, a good time, we will do. So when you look at this, you're like, well, wow, you know, okay, the age, yeah, you're doing okay, the gender, not so hot, right? Over the entire course of the project, we've been stuck at about 6% women in the community, maybe a little less in active developers. When you look at the statistics for how many women are engineers employed currently in the U.S., it's 9, 9.6%. 9, 9 when you look at it that way, maybe we're not doing that bad, but we won't rest and we'll keep working on it. Our, uh, the last category that we looked at was racial diversity, and it's really quite poor. So that's one of the things we're looking at. In terms of like where our act activity is, we have a mailing list, and we use Slack, which is a, uh, a, a way to coordinate in real time. All right. Questions, please ask a lot of them.